Welcome to 2018 and Roll to Hit Gaming's 50 Favorite Games. For Roll to Hit Gaming, I'm Lucas. I'm Joe. And I'm Chip. Now, the way that we're putting this list together, this is our 50 favorite games. We're not trying to tell you this is the 50 best games in the world. For us, these are games that we would rather play besides the ones underneath them. <laughs> now, how we each made our list may be a little bit different. So how did you make yours? Uh, I took the list from last year, and then I took uh, I, I pretty faithfully logged my plays on BGG. I took all of the games that I played in 2017. I went back all the way to BGG Con just so I'd, I'd catch that influx there through the end of 17. And then I just put that whole list through the board game ranking engine on PubMeeple. And if you haven't seen that, go check it out. Plug it in your Google machine. That's pretty cool. Um, and it presents you with a simple choice. Would you rather play this game or this game? And, you know, I went through all of that, and at the end of it, it spits out the ordered list. So um, I figured that if it wasn't on the list last year and I didn't play it this year, it couldn't jump into the list. Hmm. Um, and then I also have the policy that if I don't own it, I don't include it. Uh, but I do have one exception to that in this list, and uh, that's only because our FLGS doesn't have it yet, but as soon as I can get my hands on it, I'll fix that problem. Um, but that's how I did my list. Same here. What about you? Uh, I also use the the uh, board game ranking engine. We should probably link that down below to everybody. Um, mine was a train wreck, though. So I did this first <laughs> list. It was I used my last year's list plus anything that I'd played this year, mm -hmm. and it was it's, it was unmanageable. Um, but I did go through the exercise and I got an initial list. So then I'm telling myself, Chip, you can't just. I mean, because Puerto Rico was like down in the 300s or something. And I said, this can't stand. So I, I went back through and I called the list because there were a lot of titles like Trouble, Operation, cut those out. <laughs> you know, okay. um, didn't really think that they, they matched up. Okay, somebody's going to yell at me for that. But um, <laughs> So I did an initial call. I got myself down to about 200 games and mm -hmm. I, went and I put them back through the board game ranking engine. Well, now, so everything's looking a little bit better. But then my neurosis kicked in. I said, that's not enough. So I did it. I gave it a couple of days to kind of calm down and, and just get my mind refreshed. I went through the same list this time. So I'm using a comparable list. Went through the exercise again. Mm -hmm. Then I compared my uh, my findings from those two lists and, and found that they were pretty close, but some there was some swingy stuff. Yeah, yeah. So being the math nerd that I am, I, I cast the median values for all three lists, found the oh, midpoint wow. of all of that, and then I ranked those by the median and made my list of, of top. Of above and below. Yeah. So okay. this is great. <laughs> and y'all are probably not going to agree with much of any of it. So here we go. Let's do it. Uh, let's kick off number 50, Lucas. So I'm going to kick off number 50. And before I do, man, this year brought the wrecking ball of change yeah. to this list. So yes, you're going to see a lot of stuff move around. We're going to try to note on the bottom of the screen where things might have been if they were on the list last year. So look for that to, to fly in to give you that little bit of help. But my, my point here is my number 50 was 19 last year. Wow. And I mm. love wow. this game. And it fell all the way to number 50. And that's a Game of Thrones, the card game second edition. Okay. okay. The Fantasy Flight uh, living card game. Um, I really like this one. Um, I enjoy their, their living card game model because I'm not into opening a random pack of cards. I like knowing what I'm going to get. Mm -hmm. um, but I enjoy this one specifically because of the way it captures the theme. Because when you have a character die... They are they go out of the game, and if you had duplicates of that in your deck, even a different card of the same person, you can't use those anymore because yeah. that character is dead. And I think that captures the theme of Game of Thrones because God knows they love killing people on that show. So um, I really enjoy the way this one works. It's a great two-player head-to-head card game that, like I said, I feel like captures the, the theme pretty well. Um, the second edition tightened the bolts on it, cleaned some stuff up. The, the original edition had gotten some bloat over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and I think with each faction, um, you know, they're con every month you're getting new content for each faction. I think they're giving you a bunch of different ways to build different decks for a given faction. So you can really kind of tailor your favorite faction to suit your favorite style of play, which mm -hmm. is kind of neat too. So my number 50, A Game of Thrones, the card game. Very cool. Well, for my number 50, uh, this one dropped considerably for me as well. And I think that's going to be pretty true mm -hmm. for our, I don't know, 30 and onward. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, my number 50 was Abyss. 
Mm. Uh, I still love this game. Uh, Abyss is, it has beautiful artwork. And so the theme of it is almost, um, it's like politics, but underwater. You have all mm-hmm. these mm-hmm. sea factions uh, that are either military, political, agricultural, uh, and you're trying to sway the, the, the people. You're trying to gain uh, senators and leaders onto your side uh, so that you can accumulate the most uh, victory points. So um, with the artwork and with the theme of it being underwater, Senate politics, almost like Rome, mm-hmm. um, it was just an amazing game, and I enjoyed it so much that I just couldn't, it couldn't not be on my list. So for my number 50, Abyss. Cool game. Hey, um, my number 50, I believe, is going to be a newcomer this year, and it is, uh, it is Godfather A New Dawn. Uh, so guys, this is, this is Gangster Yahtzee. With area control, <laughs> and uh, it's it's a real simple game. You're just rolling dice, trying to match sets or straights or you know how. I mean, you know the rules of of Yahtzee. It's pretty much it, and you're taking control of the city uh, for your for your house. Um, one play revolving around the table. One player plays the Godfather, um, and the Godfather can make requests to other players, and they can choose to either fulfill the Godfather's wishes or not, and the Godfather can punish them for that. So. <laughs> Um, it's a real fast play game. It's just real fun. So mm-hmm. I'm starting off my list is going to be the Godfather, a new dawn. Yeah. The gem in that one is in the Hudson, the different areas where you can put your uh, gangsters mm-hmm. that will allow you to have, uh, some manipulation of your yes. dice, right? Yeah. So it'll let you massage mm-hmm. what you've rolled. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Neat game. Mm-hmm. So those are our number fifties. So for my number 49, it's a game that's been around a while, but it's the first time I've played it was this year, and that is In the Year of the Dragon. Mm-hmm. In the Year of the Dragon is a, I think is a very difficult game huh. to win yeah. because as you're going through your year and as you're building up your palace, uh, things are going to hit you. You know what's coming. You know it's a famine. You know that it's um, a plague. Uh, you know an army's about to invade. But you're still trying to meet the goals that you need in order to gain victory points and still be able to deal with the plague that's coming. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I find this an exceptionally fun game. Um, And it's very thinky. It's very deep. You have to think four or five moves ahead. And so that challenge is what put that on my list at number 49 in the Year of the Dragon. Is that an Uwe game? No, it's a failed and it's oh, a mean fail. fail. <laughs> and you're not mean to each other. The no. game is mean to yes, you. It, it is. is the worst year ever and you're just trying to survive, <laughs> survive. it. And normally when people start talking about misery in games, I think of Rosenberg. So. Yeah, no, this one's got it right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, for sure. Uh, my 49 is going to be a, another fun little silly game. That's Arcadia Quest, the, <laughs> the chibi dungeon delver. So uh, you guys introduced me to this and... Um, it's really fun, you know. It doesn't take itself too seriously at all. Mm-hmm. Which how can you really when you got big headed uh, miniatures <laughs> uh, as your models? But um, it's fun, and and I think it it has a um, it occupies a unique space in gaming because it, it kind of allows you if you want to get into the miniature painting realm, mm-hmm. it gives you models that aren't technically difficult right you got mm-hmm. a lot of big space on those cheap models intricate. they're not mm-hmm. intricate and you don't have to worry about you know uh, all these advanced shading techniques and all of that really stick to your base colors and just lay it down you know um so it, it offers that but the game is fun as well mm-hmm. um the dun- dungeon delving and and with the cards to kind of customize your little warband and stuff really like it and so um arcadia quest going to come in for me as as one of my favorites it's really great for families too yeah. because we have a younger uh son 10 uh he was 10 i believe when we uh introduced him to that game and he really yeah. took it to heart and enjoyed it <laughs> so definitely a good one yeah it is um, my number 49 is from academy games and it's 1775 rebellion um we called this a oh, war yeah. game at BGG Con, and he corrected us. Uh, Ooh, I did. I just can't remember what he told us it was instead. <laughs> the cool thing about these series of games, and I think this is the best one. This is my favorite one of the Birth of America series. 
Um, the cool thing about these games is if you read the rule book, you're going to learn something about what you're playing a game about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's well researched. It's well done. I really enjoy uh, their entire system. Um, but this one is essentially the American uh, Revolution, you know, mm -hmm. and you're you're trying to gain more control than the British has by the end of the game. Um, and I, I, you know, I really like the way that they give you your action cards, and in your, each one of the decks for each one of the factions, there's going to be a treaty. And the game is going to end once all four factions have signed the treaty, and eventually you're going to have to play that treaty card, yeah. whether you wanted to or not. Um, and I just thought that that's a really neat way to um, to kind of put a timer on the game, to kind of bring it to conclusion. You know, there are times where you you know you draw it straight off the bat, you don't have anything you can play in its place. So yeah. in, you know, I've seen mm -hmm. in the first turn, one of the four factions sign the treaty. You know, mm -hmm. so um, and then it goes on from there. Um, and and there's something to understanding when the best time would be to do that mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um you know and then other than that it's a little area control game you know mm -hmm. your your uh, soldiers are, are little blocks and you move them around the uh the colonies trying to gain control of those colonies and you know to the winner goes the spoils but that's, oh, yeah. that's my uh, number 49 1775 rebellion and i think that title is of, of all those birth of america series that's the one to really get involved with mm -hmm. if, you, if you are interested in it and you want to try these out because that one is sort of your base mechanics. Mm -hmm. And the the titles that come after that are sort of evolving that. Mm -hmm. They're adding a few little things into it. But the, the pure base mechanics is in 1775. And the blocks make it, man. For me, I mean, I, I feel like they're so thematic because... <laughs> I'm like, you know, I, I, they're not miniatures, none of that. I feel like, that, you know, I'm one of Washington's generals. Mm -hmm. I'm out in the field, and we've got our map spread out, and I'm moving my little colored blocks to where, you know, the Redcoats are. So uh, really cool, really cool title. I didn't get to play this one, but I got to watch. Mm -hmm. And if you're, I mean, I was totally engaged through the entire thing, and I wasn't even playing. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, sucked me into mm -hmm. the history and, and the strategy of it. So, yeah, that's a good one. Very nice. Those are our number 49s. Well, for me, number 48 is going to be one that I know JoLynn and, and Lucas don't care for too much because of the time length of the game. That is going to be, um, through the ages, a new story of civilization. Uh, I enjoy the game and and it's fiddly and but I'm I'm a bits kind of person I like that sort of stuff. Um, luckily, the, an app has been made and and actually I think for this type of game the the app is kind of the way to go with it. it it's <laughs> it's a lot more manageable with all the pieces. I can actually find players that'll play it with me. And so uh, for but but the game itself is one that I really enjoy because I'm I'm a civ building kind of fan you know um that's one of my my favorite types of themes so and this comes through for me uh, but i can see it you know it's a four hour game if you if you choose to make it so <laughs> but uh, for me through the ages a new story of civilization is going to be my number 48 uh spoiler not on my list <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> But um, would have been surprised if it was. Oh my gosh! It, it was the it was the the droning mm -hmm. same thing going on every mm -hmm. time, right? The, the the repeat, the repeat, the mm -hmm. repeat. It's it got a little mind numbing for me. But there are several people out there that do enjoy that game. It just wasn't for me. I don't have anything nice to say. So <laughs> my number forty eight is going to be Star Trek Fleet Captains. We got to play this one last year for the first time, um, and it's I've heard it described by some folks as Star Trek in a box. I'm not sure that I've found that game as mm -hmm. such a fan of the uh, of the source material, but I did really enjoy it. You know, and you're exploring. Uh, the board is set out in hexes, and when you move into a hex, you flip it over and you're exploring whatever. You know, and events happen and. Um, you know, you're trying to gain a number of victory points through these little mission cards that you have, um, and, and and that's how you end up winning the game. But I felt like it did a pretty good job of uh, capturing the feel of, you know, the Star Trek television show. So that's why I had to have it at my number 48, Star Trek Fleet Captains. It did really capture the exploration piece, because you don't know what's going to be mm -hmm. under that tile till you, you know, attempt to explore it and flip it. Mm -hmm. Um being that, like, for instance, like, you were Federation, I was Klingon in the game that we particularly played. Um, the conflict between the two of us 
it didn't seem Star Trekky enough. Right. <laughs> right. It was very well. Okay, you're there. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Is that a two player only? I think you can do some kind of team situation with multiples. It feels like a two player game. Yeah. It's team on team. Something I'm, okay. I haven't read the rules for that, but that's how it feels like okay. to do it. Okay, well, for my number 48, we're going to continue to live long and prosper, uh, but mine is Star Trek Expeditions. Mm. Uh, Expeditions, uh, unlike Fleet Captains, it is a uh, actual, it was on a board. It's just a board game, and uh, you have your Enterprise up above that's being attacked by the Klingons, and you have a crew that is down on the planet, and you have to explore that planet, and you're trying to resolve these conflicts that are going on down there, be it political, be it mechanical, because, you know, something um, has gone awry mechanically, uh, scientific, whatever the case may be, and your crew uh, cooperatively Mm -hmm. are trying to get enough skill points together with the equipment that you have and the situation that's going on in order to um, defeat that particular situation. Uh, I like the cooperative nature, especially, because, you know, if something pops up and we're like, oh, we need the the captain over there, you know, here, let me give you this so that you can help uh, mm-hmm. defeat that conflict. It was it was a good cooperative. It was very Star Trekky when it comes to the negotiations and such. So I really enjoyed it. It came in at 48, Star Trek Expeditions. Yeah, it's kind of a story-based thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you, you know, it's got a deck building element that you're building your crew as you go mm-hmm. along. And you drop down your uh, your different crew member through, through playing the cards out of your hands and they add to the skill of whatever your character is. Um, and then, you know, you make a dice roll and see whether you're successful or not. <laughs> it's, a, it's a cool little game. Those are number 48s. I'm kicking off number 47 with a title from Quinted Games, and that's Papa Paolo. Uh, Mm -hmm. We played this a couple years ago at BGG Con, and basically you're running a pizzeria, and you're trying to distribute your pizzas uh, out into the neighborhood, and you can only move so far based on how big you've built it up, and then you can can ditch your pizzas along the way, pizzas along the way, Mm -hmm. based on the size of the house as you pass Mm -hmm. your little route. So... um, I enjoyed that. The only weak point I felt it had is it had a little auction mechanic where you gained priority in the turn. Um, And we played it at three players. I think that auction mechanic is probably going to work better at four players, which is the max player count. But I really enjoyed the theme, and I enjoyed the distribution of your pizzas Mm -hmm. and building up your little pizzeria. So number 47, Papa Paolo. My favorite part of that is building up the neighborhood itself because Mm -hmm. you could put – it was like based on the the color of the roof. Mm Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. uh, so you could like manipulate the streets and the, the houses that were on your streets to where it was uh, most efficient. Right. So that puzzle piece is the part I enjoyed the most. Mm-hmm. Well, for my number forty-seven, um, I'm jumping to an adventure game, and that is Champions of Midgard. Mm-hmm. Uh, that one is really cool. I enjoy that because you can choose how to uh to do your turn do you want to go and and fight the monsters do you want to take your heroes and put them on the boat and go after the big monsters across the sea and and risk um troubles at sea or do you want to visit the um the seer and get uh what what is that the uh not the omens but basically the little artifacts to help mm-hmm. you out mm-hmm. so you're building up your warrior set which are actually dice that you roll and you're just doing this massive adventure, and your uh, weapon, um, you have to feed them and, and build your boats and stuff like that. It's just a nice Viking uh, taste, and that is Champions of Midgard. This is one that I didn't get to play because we were we were doing the shelf of shame, and I felt I felt bad about asking to play it because you know we could be playing another another game from the shelf. But I really I do want to I still want to get it to the table and try it out because I've heard a lot about it. Yeah, I can't wait to plug the two new expansions into it and mm-hmm. see, see okay. what that provides. Well, uh, so I'll move us from Star Trek of, of y'all's to another space game. And uh, this one, we don't have time for helping or assisting or uh, any of that. This is Twilight Imperium, third edition. <laughs> and we're going to have an 11-hour game. We're going <clears> to <throat> have lunch and dinner at some point during it. 
Uh, I would actually like to try the fourth edition. I haven't, haven't been able to try it yet, but um, I have a great time playing Twilight Imperium. I know it's long and, and involved, and you know you need a group that is willing to to go the go the hours to play this game. But mm. you know, if you want to play, expand, exploit, exterminate, and all the others, um, <laughs> this is the game. I mean, it's it's huge. It's sprawling, and in the end, it's it's a you know loose fin- loose friends to a fight kind of kind of game. So I, I enjoy it quite a bit. I will say you could probably definitely lose friends mm-hmm. playing that game, uh, especially if you get exterminated on your home planet. That's that's pretty rough. Uh, my favorite part of that game was the curry chicken. Yes. Thank you, Moose. That was good too. <laughs> so those were our number forty sevens. Forty-six is here, and my game of choice is Mission Red Planet. Oh, yeah. That was a fun, fun game where you're uh, using a, a deck of cards, and it's a action selection, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, you choose your card, and you can either put little mar- uh, little astronauts on your rocket ship, send your rocket ship up to Mars, um, and you can't get those cards back until you reset or play them all. So... Uh, it was a really fun game because when, once you're on Mars, you can explore a little bit, find gemstones and crystals. Uh, the artwork on the, the, the edition that I have, uh, it's the newest one, mm-hmm. uh, that one was just wonderful, steampunky, cartoony looking. I, I mm-hmm. absolutely adore this game. Uh, and that one is Mission Red Planet. Yeah, I think it's a neat little kind of gateway area control thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a timing. There's an art to the timing of when you play your action selection mm-hmm. cards that I'm not good at at all. So <laughs> um, I have a tendency to blow the ship up at the wrong moment or be on the ship that gets blown up. Um, <laughs> but I, I really enjoyed the game once you get your guys on Mars and you're, you're fighting for control there and fighting for the resources there. Mm-hmm. Cool game. Yeah, I like this game too. Um, we found it at the right time and, and it just... Out of the box, it was just really fun. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, glad it's in our collection. Um, mine is going to be uh, a consolidation of tiles, so, uh, and that's the Dice Masters series. Mm-hmm. Okay. I, I just um, I needed to list it as one thing just because there are so many different types that I didn't want to fill my, my list up with them and throw things off. But um, I really like Dice Masters. Form a team. Um, with your cards, and I, I tend toward the superhero stuff, mm-hmm. um, but they do have mm-hmm. some Dungeons and Dragons, and then uh, they're going to be coming out with uh, Warhammer 40k mm-hmm. uh, from the Games Workshop uh, line. Yu-Gi-Oh but, for the kids. And Yu-Gi-Oh for the kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I tend to stick around the, the superheroes, but it's just a really fun um, implementation. I like how you build your team, and then you've kind of got to earn your dice to get them on yeah. the board. You don't necessarily start with them at the ready. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's a neat thing for me. And then um, and then just having them, you know, kind of battle your your, your opponents. Um, for me, it's it's one of my favorites, Dice Masters. I really like the fact that you can build a team of villains mm-hmm. and you can have, you know, uh, Lex Luthor and Evil uh, Sinestro and, you know, just all together in your, in your bag and you're you know, yeah. pulling them out and, and going to war. So, yeah, it's a very cool game. I'm going to stick in the dice arena for my number 46, and that is Elder Sign. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is Arkham Eldrick, the dice game, you know. And, you know, it's kind of the same thing. You're going into a room, having an encounter, or fighting a monster, and in doing so, you're rolling your dice, um, you know, and, you know, getting re-rolls or storing them on your equipment and trying to overcome the needed symbols that are on that challenge Mm -hmm. in order to defeat the monster or score the room and, you know, gain the Elder Sign. Um, really neat game. Uh, they, they keep putting out expansions for this, and every time they do, it adds something really nice mm-hmm. into the game. Mm-hmm. So um, I think now uh, Elder Sign is a really, uh, it's not fully realized because they're still putting out expansions, but it's a really nice, meaty dice game. Okay. Mm-hmm. I love this game. Um, and for me, it was in my, in my uh, coming into board games, when I came to Elder Sign, it was a... Um, I'd never experienced this mechanic before, mm-hmm. and and that's the you have a card that'll give you a list of of roles you got to meet, right? Mm-hmm. And then you have this pool of dice you're trying to 
trying to roll them, but then you know you hit the symbol, you lose the dice to it, right? Right. right. And so and that just blew my mind. I mean, you know, and I, I love it to this day. I love that game. Yeah. Those are our number forty sixes. My number 45 is going to be Carson City, in particular the big box version, because it has all the, the tasty uh, special components. And so, uh, funny story behind that is you guys bought me this for uh, my birthday, and Lucas, you were buying it because I had mentioned these yeah. little metal uh, dollars and metal <laughs> coins that I thought were so so novel, mm -hmm. and the big box doesn't come with those. Those are right. those, <laughs> those are like an add-on pack that you gotta you gotta buy. But still, there's a great game inside this. Um, we've only played the base version, and we need mm -hmm. to add the horses and everything else from the expansions. But um, you're essentially building the city of Carson City all together. All the players are working. Uh, to put that, so the map is going to get tight on you, mm -hmm. and you're going to have to manage that. And then the action track, uh, it kind of it goes in sequence, right? So there's mm -hmm. a snaking track of actions you can select, and then they're going to play out in in an order. And so um, figuring out if you want to get before your opponents or after your opponents, where you want to put your put your guys, is one of the strategy, one of the you know decisions to be made right. in this game. It's really yeah. cool and a fun Western thing. I do remember it took us a while to get it to the table mm -hmm. because the rule book was so intimidating. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a little beefy. <laughs> yeah, and in that box, part of the intimidating is, you know, there's some number of modules. Oh, yeah. You're kind of like, what, what is this? Yeah. What is this? I still want to throw them all together. Sure, <laughs> yeah. let's do it. Um, uh, my number 45 is going to be The Pursuit of Happiness. Um, I've talked about this on the channel a few times. Um, we also did a solo playthrough mm -hmm. uh, of this game, and I really enjoy playing it. Basically, you you start off as a kid and you go through the uh, the ages of your life until you until stress finally kills you. Um, uh, you know, going out and you know getting a job or working on this project or you know gaining a comic book collection, whatever it is, you're trying to pursue happiness uh, and gain the most victory points out of having the most fulfilling life that you can. You know, and if you throw in a little health there along the way, you may be able to get a turn that you're opponents don't have because they live a little harder and died a little younger. Um, <laughs> just days ago, the, can you, the new community expansion for this uh, showed up, and I haven't had a chance to play it yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. Always a great time when it hits the table, the pursuit of happiness. It is a really good game. It, it's fun. Um, he makes fun of me, thinking that I don't like it as, as much as he does, uh, because I wanted more realism yeah. to it. I wanted that struggle of, you know, <clears throat> debt or, mm -hmm. you know, you lost your job or something like that. You want that. to struggle with debt, why don't you start paying the mortgage? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> uh, so I just want a little bit more grittiness to it, but um, it is a good game. It really yeah, it is. is. It's fun. And the, like you said, it's, it's interesting because if you make the choice to focus on health, mm -hmm. you may be able to play longer mm -hmm. where your opponent is trying to rush for the big payoff in the beginning. Right. So, mm -hmm. and it's not a given that if you live longer, you'll win. No, it's not. I, you know, uh, if you if you are, it's kind of risk versus reward with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool game. Well, for my number forty-five, I chose Eclipse. Mm. Uh, this is a, um, a a space game, uh, sci-fi, where you're you're in your ship and you're running missions and and exploring planets, and I just. It was everything I thought that a you know ex a, a broad expanding space epic game should be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. And so uh, Eclipse is definitely one I want to keep on my shelf mm -hmm. and play again and again because it, it was just very satisfying. Yeah, I'm a I'm a sci-fi nerd, right? So yeah. all these space games I love anyway. Eclipse is an awesome one. It's sort of like the Twilight Imperium for people who raise their pinkies when they drink tea. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah, for yeah, the it's, refined it's, sort. It's the Euro four X. Yeah, 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 and it really works on that level. Neat game. <laughs> and those are our number forty fives. I'm going to kick off 44 uh, with a game that I kind of view as uh, Twilight Struggle Light, and okay. that is 13 Days to Cuban Missile mm -hmm. Crisis. Uh, I really enjoy this one. It takes one piece of that whole Cold War era story, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and has you play that out. Um, and the neat thing is 
you're gaining influence in the various regions uh, in order to be able to do the things you need to do. But what you're really trying to do, and this kind of breaks thematically with me, is get your opponent to launch nuclear war. Because the person <laughs> that launches is the person that loses. Um, now, we did find out that you can, if you're not managing your situation well, you can cause a launch that you didn't want to cause. <laughs> um, I thought it captured that same feel from, uh, you know, uh, 1989 or Twilight Struggle in a much more condensed uh uh, Thirty-minute fashion. Mm-hmm. So you know when you're when you're looking for that feel, but you don't have a ton of time to play a game like that. I'd suggest Thirteen Days: The Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm, um, I really did like that game. Uh, I was in uh, one in particular with one of our friends uh, with Johnny, and we were like down to the wire, and I was about to win, and I threw down a card triumphantly. And I ended up making myself launch, so <laughs> and I lost. I got cocky, uh, but yeah, it is a, a lot of fun and it is a quick game. I enjoy yeah, so that you one. changed it from a cold war to a hot war. Yep. I That's did. What you lose. Yeah, didn't <laughs> it? Uh, well, mine is going to be our first uh, our first duplicate of the uh, of the series, and it's seventeen seventy five rebellion. Uh, I just I can't speak highly enough of this game and of the company. It's an awesome game. We've already talked about it, so that's going to be my pick. Well, for my number 44, um, I chose The Godfather Corleone's Empire. Um, this is a, a really fun game. Uh, I think we, if you've watched our channel before, we've talked about it before. Um, it's not necessarily The Godfather, but it is gangster. Uh, mm-hmm. You are going out in New York, and you are trying to control the boroughs, and you're uh, trying to collect... Um, the supplies you need in order to win, be it guns or um, drugs or whatever the case may be. And you're you're completing these missions in order to put money in your briefcase, and that's going to cause you to win or lose the game at the end. So, really good mobster game, uh, The Godfather Corleone's Empire, number 44. Yeah, I might have something to say about this one at some point. <laughs> Those are our number 44s. So for my number 43, I picked Century Spice Road. Mm. Uh, this is a, a game that we played off the shelf of shame. It's, it was new this mm-hmm. year, um, but it is a really fun, thinky little game uh, to where you're purchasing merchants in order who give you powers in order to basically exchange spice cubes. You can trade this or uh, obtain them or trade them. So uh, you could... Uh, trade a brown one for three yellows you know whatever the case may be and you're and you're building up uh in order to get more cards it's just a very uh, a very cool puzzle in that mm-hmm. century spice road i think i like your list better than mine this, yeah i really <laughs> like i really like that. yeah it's yeah. got a really neat hand management aspect to it mm-hmm. at its heart it is just a cube pusher but yeah. that, that hand management with mm-hmm. the different merchants is, is the the interesting part and the it. art is beautiful the oh art yeah it's pretty yeah. So, uh, well, my forty-three is going to be uh, Rattus Cardus. This is a, a ah. little, a little simple game. You're trying to fight the plague, or fr- well, not you're trying to try to survive the plague, I guess. Like fighting <laughs> survive it. it, yeah, survive it. Um, but it's neat, you know. Uh, this is a card version of um, Rattus. Of Rattus, mm-hmm. and uh, we haven't played that one yet. But I think I think the card game has made me want to play the the full version. Um, you are essentially you're trying to. Uh, not have so many rats that it kills you outright. Uh, <laughs> so there's that kind of management. There's a, it's a, mm. it's but almost that's kind of a secret reveal. Too, that, that is a secret sure. There's sort of like yeah. a stock mechanic almost in a way. It's not money. It's mm-hmm. people and influ- influence. In, right. You're balancing rats to nuns. Yeah. Rats to nuns. And then you have to get your influences up on nobles and other mm-hmm. places. You know, uh, it's a neat little game, compact. You know, mm-hmm. it's a rat rat cardus. I like this. One. Good pick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one that you shouldn't judge a book by its cover on mm-hmm. because it doesn't look like anything. That's right. Yeah. Nope. And but the game in there is, is really good. It's got a big mm-hmm. horse butt on the front of the cover. Oh my! <laughs> it does. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> um, my number forty-three is Shakespeare, um, mm-hmm. and just from a mechanics perspective, I would love this game. Mm-hmm. But it adds a theme that I'm really interested in, and that is putting on a Shakespearean play. Mm-hmm. You know, and you're you're trying to 
get the right actors in your studio, costume them properly, and then you know every few turns you have a different act of your mm-hmm. of your play, and you score points based on how well you do in that. Um, it's a nice, quick, maybe uh, maybe thirty minute thing. I think mm-hmm. we played it the day we opened the box. We played it like seven times in a row. Yeah. It was just it was just addicting. It's a really nice game. The art is great. Um, the different characters that are in it have different needs, which gives you some variety mm-hmm. that you need to strive for in putting on your performance. And I really like this theme. I'd like to see more games where you're gearing up to put on a performance of some kind. We have a couple, and I think this is my favorite of those, Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. That's very, very pretty game. It's an easy game to mm-hmm. to, to flow through. Uh, the, the rules aren't that difficult, so it's a great, I would say, uh, intro game. Yeah, it's a light. To go in light there. It's very thing. light and, and good for an afternoon of fun. And those are our number 43s. Well, 42, and I'm going to start it off with an old classic for me. Um, one of, I think, our group's all time favorites. That is Lords of Waterdeep. And, wow. Uh, this was our, our, maybe our first introduction to worker placement. The first one I can remember, kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, We're all big D&D nerds, so uh, I think the theme just caught us just right. Mm-hmm. And this game is, has been a, a favorite of all of ours. I, Lucas, you and I got the app version of yeah. it. I think we played a thousand games of <laughs> yeah. it. So um, it, it's just, it's a solid game. I always like going back to it. We got the expansions, which come, it's kind of a double expansion um, Skullport and Undermountain. Uh, yeah. Um, we found that really we want to do just one or the other. Right. Yeah. We, we tried playing it with both, and it was just a little bit much. But yeah. um, <laughs> but adding just one was just kind of a sweet spot. So mm-hmm. yeah, uh, uh, Skullport makes it a little a uh, little meaner. Mm-hmm. And, and corruption too. Corrupt. And, uh, so. and which I, I enjoyed the corruption mechanic that it adds. And then the other one just kind of opens up. More spots. More, more spots. Yeah. So it's depending mm-hmm. on how you play, you can't go wrong. With yeah, well, that's, that's my number 42. <laughs> I'm just a little surprised it's, it's down at 42. It's kind of like we talked about, the wrecking ball of change to these yep. lists. Yep. Um, you, that is an all-time favorite, but dropped a lot. My number 42 is one that we played just a couple weeks ago. It was one of the very last games we played in our 2017 Shelf of Shame Challenge, and that's Chaos in the Old World. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, Eric Lang, Fantasy Flight. You don't really need much more than that to get me to pick it up. Um, and then it added it added also the world of Warhammer Fantasy Battles yeah. from Games Workshop, which I'm a big fan of. Um, and it's a really neat game. It's a, it's a highly interactive area control game. And, you mm-hmm. know, you're, you're scoring points based on how much corruption you can bring into the world, right? The, the chaos gods are the bad guys, if you will in that lore so they're literally trying to ruin the different regions Mm -hmm. on the board and whoever can ruin the world the best is going to be the (laughs) winner so um i I know that some think it's a little a little dark Dark. uh theme wise for them but if you really like these heavy highly interactive area control games you're going to enjoy chaos in the old world i definitely did they they added an expansion to it to bring in the horned rat Mm -hmm. uh, which is skaven if you're a skaven player so since I am, that was like yes, I can like finally you know spread pestilence and all that. Mm-hmm. It was great. Love it. The the theme is hard to get past, or like mm-hmm. to look beyond. Right. I like it. Right. Uh, don't get me wrong, and I think it's a great game. Um, but just the core mechanics there, the twist on area control, mm-hmm. and the modifications that you can do, it's as, uh, asymmetric. Yes, it is. Each faction is different, and learning how to play each faction is part challenge. of getting into the game. Mm-hmm. Um, but, man, it really plays out, and it's a really neat implementation of area control. Good game. Oh, it's me. Uh, so for my number 42, I chose Xenoshift Dreadmire. Uh this is a game to where it's a cooperative game, and uh, to me, in my mind, it kind of reminded me of Starship Troopers, yep. right? You're you're part of the coalition, and you're trying to protect the base, and there's these aliens that are coming in uh, to destroy it. Um, it's cooperative in nature, so that if you know someone needs help defeating uh, uh, the monsters that are coming against the base, then you can like, hey, have some equipment, or hey, have this troop uh, to help them defeat it, because if they end up destroying the base, you lose. Yeah. Uh, the thing with Dreadmire, um, they have um, they've added more challenges for the monsters. You know, for for it to be more difficult, a little bit. They've added the weather 
mm-hmm. element to it. So some monsters are more powerful, either, you know, when it's foggy or at night or, or stormy. So it's it took Xenoshift and just amped it up just mm-hmm. a little bit yeah. more. And I thoroughly enjoy that one. That Xenoshift Dreadmire at 42. Yeah, this is another one of those games that will just pound you. Mm -hmm. Um, The last time we played it, we got to the very last player's last action and lost the base. So you Mm -hmm. couldn't make it any further into the game and still lose than (laughs) we did in that one. Uh, But yeah, it is a constant cooperative struggle. Mm -hmm. Good choice. Those are our number 42s. So my number 41 is going to be my first entry on the list. I probably won't be the last from Uwe Rosenberg, and that's Fields of Arl. Um, the, you know, this is kind of his standard fare of farming mm-hmm. and taking your animals and your goods, converting them to other things, build buildings and score points. Uh, there's a couple twists on this one. The first is you're building these uh, these dikes and pushing them back to get you know, to make the water recede so that you can have more farmable land. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is, this is a two-player only game. And, Mm -hmm. you know, each player is going to have four workers in each season, the spring and then the the winter. And the different actions available during those seasons are different. You Mm -hmm. know, in the... In the winter, you're going to be trapping and and doing those sorts of things. Whereas in the spring, you're going to be foresting and planting crops and doing those sorts of things, you know. And along the way, you can, you have these tools for each available action. And if you upgrade your tools, when you take Mm -hmm. that action, that action becomes more efficient Mm -hmm. for you because Mm -hmm. you've upgraded your tools in doing it. Um, You know, like many of his other games, there's a really nice meaty puzzle in, mm-hmm. in, in you know, making everything work together so that you can score your victory points. And I really like Fields of Arl. So another a really nifty piece to that is uh, not only are you upgrading your tools, but you're also upgrading your carts because mm-hmm. uh, the bigger cart that you have, the more stuff from what you've harvested or built can be delivered into the city. Well, mm-hmm. that's where you get another part of your victory points. Uh, the bigger the city, the bigger the cart you need, so you can haul more stuff a further distance. As it's really neat how it all works together. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going through the seasons, but the end result is you you need mm-hmm. to to deliver your product to to make money to to do more. So uh, that was a really nifty part of it that I liked. So for my number forty one, I chose uh, Kanagawa. This is one that was. Uh, relatively new. We just played it last month. You know, it was very recent. Uh, but it is a very pretty game to where you are, you're a student in a Japanese paint studio and you are expanding your studio with like the paint brushes and such, mm-hmm. uh, learning uh, more knowledge from the teacher. And you're also building this big mural of uh, 11 cards. Within this mural, you could be adding landscapes, portraits, animals, um, and all of that combination will get you more points near the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first person to reach the the 11th card uh, to, to finish their mural, that's the end game trigger, and then you start uh, determining how well you did. Uh, it's very pretty, very thinky. You have to think ahead, and you and you have to determine. Okay, so I've done this piece of it. Now, do I want to go for the seasons, or do I mm-hmm. want to go for the landscape? So I really enjoyed it. It was very relaxing to play, and that's Kanagawa. Well, my uh, mind list is going to finish off with another uh, game of intrigue, and uh, that you might lose friends over. But um, it's the Game of Thrones, the board game. Mm-hmm. And uh, this one is another kind of sprawling game. Uh, It's got room for five or six players, and I like it that way uh, because the board fills up and and you really get a chance to make some wheeling and dealing happen, Uh, a lot of intrigue and expansion into the board. And really the game rests on a razor's edge because it comes down to whoever controls a number of castles wins the game, and that can happen instantly. Yeah. You know, uh, you drop your guard at one point, you make a deal and you trust the wrong person. <laughs> yeah. And whammo, you know, they, they swoop in and all of a sudden they've won. Mm-hmm. And so that combined with the theme, I love Game of Thrones, the story, um, it just really, really works. So it takes a 
couple three hours to play it, but um, but it's a good game all around. Depending on the area that you get, uh, you know, if you're in the north, it's sprawling. If if you have a big enough number of player counts, you can get the Martell mm-hmm. down in Dorne. Again, that's that's very sprawling. But if you're stuck in the middle, yeah, man, you got where you're sides. near, when you're surrounded on all sides, you really have to fight it out. It's tense. It yeah. is. It's very tense. Yeah, you drew Lannister, and we're kind of under siege there. I did. Lannister is kind of under siege, under siege right? so, <laughs> all the time. Yeah, this is another one of those. Uh, you know, our these this first ten here seem to have a lot of these games. Another mm-hmm. one of these highly interactive area control games. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I'd put this in the same list if you like that. You're gonna like this. Well, thank you for joining us. This has been our uh, fifty through 41 of our favorite games uh keep watching and you'll see more but for roll to hit gaming i'm joe i'm chip and i'm lucas